بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome to another episode of the Middle West Podcast I'm your host Thaqib Musa um, That lovely sip there, a uh, bit of ASMR was yes. from my co-host uh, Abdul Sami Arjumand Assalamu um, alaikum this is, this, is why, this is why we didn't have you last episode uh, I'm it's also it's joined fine. by my second co-host uh, Asad Hussain Assalamu alaikum And uh, we're joined in studio which is in Luton today um, So we're, we're down in, uh, in beautiful Luton uh, Joined by Dr. Mamnoon Khan Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Sambarakati. Thank you very much for having us. Um, so getting right into it, um, Dr. Mamnoon is a, uh, he has a doctorate from Cambridge in neurobiology. Uh, Bi- in uh, molecular immunology. M- molecular immunology. Yeah. Sorry. I, um, it's all I, the s- similar stuff. Yeah. I, I completely went down the wrong it's, route it's, there. It's all to do with genetics, mm. um, science, yeah, yeah, biology. It's all, it is, okay. it's all biology, right? So okay. it's, all, yeah, it's all the same yeah. thing. Um, uh, it's just, all about yeah. substrates and uh, enzymes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, Good. and uh, and then you went into a uh, you're in a tech tech company, a communications company right now. Yeah, uh, one of the biggest in the UK, and you're also the author of the book "Being British Muslims," uh, which we which we're looking at today, um, and that's what we that's what we've got you on to talk about. Uh, so welcome. It's great to have you guys in Luton. Uh, yeah, um, it's, well, a, it's a brilliant. Uh, I was going to say it's a brilliant house. I meant it's a, it's a brilliant masjid. Well, that that is how most mosques started, right? Uh, as did this one. You buy a house, and then the community builds around it, and you buy the house next door, and then you break the walls down, and then soon they'll buy the football club next door. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the football club is going to move from that location. Oh, so. are they? Oh, wow, so. I I actually said this as a joke to Thak <laughs> before this. I was like, uh, what happens usually is that you, you buy a house. Uh, you buy the house next door, then you break the walls, and eventually you find land that becomes free in, around the area. It, it could be like a pub or something, and then yeah. you convert the pub into a mall. Yeah. So and that, so, uh, we made the joke about the football stadium thing. Eventually, they'll move off. Either they'll go into liquidation or they'll become a Premier League club one day. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's be realistic here. That's a bit, that's a bit harsh. Uh, Luton can have a uh, Premier League club. Uh, we love Luton, right, don't worry, okay. uh, except Tommy Robinson. Um, Tommy, but, right? Yeah, Tommy, Tommy. Okay. That's what I said. Not Tony. I said Tommy. Oh, fair enough. And then yeah, basically, like, eventually they'll move out, and then the mosque will buy that land, and then just convert. Uh, you never know. Allah, so Allah are, works in mysterious you, ways. Are you Luton born and raised? I, I'm raised in Luton. I wasn't born in Luton. Where okay. were you? I was born in Bangladesh. Okay. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. So you're not really British. So <laughs> he's, he's as British as you are because you're from Bangladesh as well. <laughs> I am not. So he's from East London, right? Whitechapel, yeah. yeah. uh, which is why we say that he's just an honorary Bang- Bangladeshi, mashallah, you know. Basically, yeah. But then he gets offended because he's racist. I'm not offended. <laughs> Allah Akbar. Basically, yeah, I'm proud uh, of being from Tower Hamlets, uh, yeah. the only Pakistani that lives in that area. Awesome. Uh, but You're uh, probably not. There is probably more. Probably one or two others. And So if you're out there, then please hit me up because I'm all alone in... <laughs> Are you in, gl- you're in Scotland now, though, That's true, though. I've moved up to Scotland now. Made, so. made hijra, freedom. Made hijra. Well, oh, Hijra is a very contentious world. topic. We might be talking about it today. We will. Do yes, it. so let's start with that. Being British <laughs> yeah. Muslims, right? Yeah. So um, mm. the the book is. Uh, I mean, I highly recommend. It. I I read it. It's a collection of articles that mm. you wrote um, on kind of uh, various platforms, and I think one of the key concepts that you're trying to get through is that uh, British Muslims is a. Uh, it's we are big enough now, and we're solid enough as a community um, to have our own kind of. Um, you can say almost our our own mature line of thought and and reasoning, and therefore kind of start thinking independently. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 uh, what the book is about. Um, I think you know, if you look at the situation of Muslims in the UK, you know, in the nineteen fifties, we had about um, about a hundred thousand Muslims in the UK and about and a handful of mosques. Um, so post war, a lot of labor shortage in the UK, a lot of uh, in- uh, immigration happened as a result of that, and then progressively. Um, that that was the first generation, and then progressively more people came uh, up until sort of the eighties, um, and then sort of the that sort of first generation coming, sort of the big stem, um, ended at that point, sort of uh, in the eighties. And then thanks to Mrs. Thatcher, because <laughs> um, it was it was that sort of thing. Like I think it was um, if you were from the Commonwealth country, you got uh, you were able to come uh, visa free and work and live and work here. Until I think it was Thatcher who changed it. I think, um, it, yeah, I, I'm not sure who who changed it, but it would have been Thatcher at that time. Yeah, um, uh, I think you know you you might have heard the word Windrush generation. Yes, yeah, right. The Windrush generation up until 1972 or 73. That that generation is known as the Windrush generation, and it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, technically, you're the Windrush generation. Oh really? Yeah. I thought, yeah, was, I, I thought it was specific to Windrush, Caribbean people. Yeah, as in yeah. the. 
people from? No, it's, um, yeah, I mean, um, originally the Caribbean came and there was a, the whole reason why it's called Windrush is because there was a, there was a ship, it's called the Windrush, yeah. right? And that's the, f- the first few Caribbeans came on that ship. And then subsequently that whole sort of period got termed Windrush generation up until 1973. But officially it sort of ended 1972 or 73. Um, and and there was there was a different sort of immigration uh, rules around who can come and how you can come, and uh, if you happen to be in the right place, you can apply for those certain visas or whatever, and then you come here. And then uh, you know that generation they sort of had a what, what I call a myth of return, which is basically they came here uh, thinking okay they would make their money and then eventually they'll go back home, right? This idea of back home came from them really, and then what happened was uh, they realized that um, you know as as they so they came, the first generation, they were young. They were sort of, uh, you know, late 20s, 30s, maybe early 40s. So they got married. They had kids back in back home back then, right? And then those kids, you know, um, came over and then they married and eventually the population increased. And then uh, to the extent that you've got like third generation now, we're, into, we're over 3 million. Uh, some, some figures put it to about 3.5 million, probably at the higher end. Uh, we'll find out in the next census in a couple of years' time. Um, and we've got, you know, something like 2,000 mosques or prayer spaces. So it's been a phenomenal increase in Muslims. And if you project that forward, some of the most conservative projections, kind of w- what I sort of think they're conservative, is, um, you know, we're talking about it's going to double by about 2050. So then you're talking about 10% of the UK population could potentially be Muslims. That's significant. And what that means is we have to actually think about Islam and being Muslims in a in a way which um, allows us to um, to uh, kind of um, get away from all the problems that we might have today, you know, we have to be proactive in this area now. Yeah, one of the things you talked about in terms of growth of the community is um, in terms of immigration and kind of the growth of that population. Um, and and I guess what I'm not getting a sense of is, uh, and and I think it's fairly low anyway. I've I've read some numbers on conversion, for example, numbers being. Uh, there's a 95% regression rate. Like when I say regression rate, it's like 95% of converts uh, change ba- or revert back into. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't say revert because it's a charge term, but they go back to the kind of they they leave Islam again. Yeah. Um, within a year of uh, mm. of kind of embracing, um, and and I think that means that, well, that's one of the kind of factors behind why our Muslim community in Britain tends to be so kind of uh, well, I would. We're we're not ethnically diverse in kind of we're we're all part of diversity because we're a minority here. But um. yeah, I think that's that's a good point. I think um, if you look at the um, in the last census, forty uh, percent of the um, of Muslims were like under I think it's the age of nineteen uh, in twenty eleven. Well, compared to the uh, the, main, the the bigger uh, the UK population, it was twenty four percent. So you got this kind of uh, demographic uh, skewing. And uh, what that will mean is the um, the ethnicities, ethnicities that you had um, strong in 2011. It's going to there's going to be more of that ethnicity. So yeah, I think you got the convert situation as well, which unlike in America, situation in America is quite different to the UK. Most of the growth in the UK is happening because of the ethnic and um, the ethnic Muslims, uh, their populations growing. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's not as much conversion, which I guess is a different mm-hmm. conversation about how. We need to work on making our faith more kind of appeal to appeal to kind of your general mm-hmm. populace and, and and show them that actually uh, Islam is a great way to go. I guess that's like part of the conversation. And like, as you mentioned, twenty fifty, that the population will hopefully have uh, reached. What was the figure again? It was uh, according to according to sort of my estimates, is about it's going to be about six and a half million. So if you're looking at six and a half million, that's basically restricting it to. The, uh, the 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 migrant community basically uh, or the ethnic uh, Muslims, but uh, so that's not necessarily a, 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 I guess I guess a growth of Muslims. It's more just a, gro- a growth of like uh, people of Pakistani or Arab or Bangladeshi kind of communities, and I think that's probably why we're actually here uh, to talk about like okay, what about the, the actual Muslim community? Because given that uh, sh- should that number have increased? But I guess it, you know because of the fact that yeah, I think um, that no, I think you're you're actually hitting uh, you know the the core of the book really there. So if you look at you know ten fifteen years ago, we would have called ourselves you know British Arabs or British Bangladeshis or British Pakistanis or British Indians. No one calls themselves that now. We we call ourselves British Muslims. We've almost we've almost um, 
you know, kind of uh, made this leap, right? Um, and identifying ourselves through our faith, then the question is, what is the reality? Is, is in reality, are we, how close to that faith are we? And this is the crux of the book. The book says, look, there's lots of contentions. And if you really want to be um, confidently call yourself Muslim and be able to kind of be an ambassador to the faith, then there's, there's this contention. You need to sort these things out first as a way of baselining to then kind of bring the, the great virtues and the values of Islam to this population. Because one of the reasons why um, I think uh, we don't have as big a convert community in the UK as you have in, in America and is because actually, um, you know, it's an ethnic religion, you know, it's an ethnocentric religion. Um, so we, we do religion, we do Islam, we do being Muslim through uh, ethnic sort of filters and I, ethnic biases. I just want biases. to pick up that, that mm. term there, the do Islam term, because your foreword is by Sheikh Nazami, and I've heard him use yeah. it a few times as well. Mm. Do you want to give us a little bit of context into that kind of that terminology of do Islam? Yeah, I think um, uh, most people use Islam as a noun, okay, yeah. religion. But actually, if you look at, if you study Islam, it's, um, you know, your iman is based on your actions, Right. Um, so it's it's actually we should be using the term do Islam much more than we have been, and this actually for, um, uh, it highlights another point, which is you know uh, Muslims speaking in English is quite is quite a recent phenomenon. You know, over the last you know thirty, forty, fifty years that we've actually uh, picked up the English language, and a lot of the difficulties we have is we haven't really adapted the way we speak about Islam and, you know, just general conversations really, you know, and um, about Islam um, with, the, with the right kind of vernacular. So we kind of, we embroil, our, embroil ourselves in certain um, structures, right? And then we can't really express Islam in a way which is much more meaningful, much more relevant, much more inspiring. And again, this is one of the aspects of the book, tries to say, okay, look, we've got to do this. So do you mean like part of that is like, for example, a lot of the literature we use, um, I, I've been I've been told like like uh, a lot of people recommend kind of first sirah. Still, people read Muhammad by Martin Lings, yeah. uh, which I think was written in the fifties. Quran translations we use Yusuf Ali and Marmaduke Pictou, both mm. written, I believe, in the fifties and sixties, uh, or, or yeah, somewhere around that time. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting you pick the pick pick those two people because in a recent um, seminar I gave to uh, the convert community in Luton, I kind of said to them, look. If you look at the convert community's um, contribution to Muslims in uh, in the UK has been phenomenal. If you so, for instance, you know the first Grand Mufti, uh, first and only Grand Mufti of the UK, who was appointed by the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Caliph, right, was uh, Abdullah Abdul Quilliam. Yeah. If you then look at the first um, the first Muslim, con- the first Muslim to translate the Quran into English was convert Mahmudu Pikto, yeah. If you then uh, go further, the first person to write a, a biography, uh, not a biography, a kind of a journal, a, 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 a rihla type of um, account of her journey to, um, uh, to Hajj was um, Evelyn Kobold, a convert, convert wow. lady from the UK. If you then progr- uh, st- go further, the first Muslim uh, school to be fund- publicly funded by the government, uh, whose was it? Yusuf Islam School. Wow. Convert. If you then project a bit more f- uh, closer to us, the first Muslim college, universities, um, you know, uh, higher, 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 higher um, education that looks at contextualizing Islam, it's uh, Cambridge Muslim College, established by uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, a convert. So basically, what I, what I was trying to say to them is, converts have already done a phenomenal work for uh, Muslims, the cause of Islam in the UK. And, uh, you know, where, where are we, you know, in terms of the ethnic Muslims? Where are we? What, what's going on there? You, you, you mentioned, and this is kind of triggering a, a few thoughts, so if I do kind of, I guess, not, not explain myself properly, then uh, apologize about that. But when you mentioned about, like, um, we've only just managed to kind of grasp onto the English language and are starting to excel. And, of course, when you look at uh, education levels as well, uh, it was only until, like, the 90s uh, you had... The, uh, the first generation of of the ethnics going into university, for example, or even in, in the in the noughties. and gradually, of course, uh, the community itself. And when it first came, uh, all the ethnicities kind of stuck to each other, uh, and they kind of stayed within their bubbles. Uh, and I guess the notion of it was because of the fact that when they first came here, the, the levels of uh, hatred that was uh, put towards them in terms of racism that was very much prevalent at the time, at least on the streets. 
uh, you know, terms like uh, Paki bashing, that, that kind of stuff was around so much that kind of forced them to kind of be inwards as a community. And that, I, I, when you look at East London, for example, and uh, the gangs that were created around them, the gangs were initially created because of uh, safety because of the fact that you know uh, there's you know white skinheads are out there they have to get us so we need to make sure that we're closely knit together so because of uh, I guess the the fact that uh, there was that fear of getting out of the community they kind of refrained uh, from kind of being out of the comfort zones because of I guess uh, genuine da- dangers to like their faith and their lives mm-hmm. and I think that kind of thing may be still existing and maybe perhaps that could be a big barrier to maybe actually contributing towards society as a whole, which I guess for converts wouldn't have, they wouldn't have had that barrier because they already feel like they're already part of society, i.e. British yeah. society. So I think just on that first point about um, racism, one of the book tries to establish is, one of the things it tries to establish is um, how do we think about problems? Because actually, and I've, uh, there's a chapter there that's, that's called um, um, Faith Demands Lean Problem Solving. Because all of the prophets... Um, they were all problem solvers of one kind or another. They, whether if it's family, whether if it's personal, whether if it's, you know, um, uh, institutions, uh, governments, whatever, they actually fixed problems. So it, the, the idea of solving problems, it should be innate, should be, should be taught to us just by virtue of learning about the prophets um, of the Quran, and um, and <clears throat> you know, it's 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 a, it's a big tradition in in Islam. So, so the reason I mentioned that is. This problem that you've, you've highlighted, racism, one of the things that we need to do is look at um, problems holistically. So in societies, you've got this structure versus agency sort of issue uh, thing in sociology, they call it. So how, how, how much does the structure determine your state of affairs versus how much agency do you have to change society, right? So, in, so this racism, so, um, so the racism is actually an external factor that it impacted them. But I would actually say, I would actually, I would actually point, not necessarily to that, but I would actually point to the reality that a lot of the first generation Muslims that came to the UK, they were uneducated. They didn't go to university. A lot of them could not read or write. Um, um, there's hardly, you know, there's very few who actually um, went to university and came to the UK, right? Um, so, so when you come from that kind of background, right, you can't, you can't, you can't say, okay, racism... Uh, it was because of racism that they didn't actually um, they didn't they didn't actually you know come out of the shell. There were in there were inherent factors which prevented them as well. And so and if you, if you look at Islam, how how many of them were actually um, learned in religion? You know, back in that first generation, not many. Um, so we have to look at things holistically. And what we do when we when we do that, then we find actually there's lots of different factors involved here, and we don't sort of just put it to social factors that you know prevent us from doing things there's a lot of things we we have within ourselves that we can do to help ourselves um and and so 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 i think back to the um, convert um question there um i think i think what one thing with the uh, that first and second generation did not do and it's it's up to us a uh, third generation muslims to to try and do which is contextualizing islam so when you speak to a convert they will say yeah they were really attracted to um islam and then when they became Muslim, what they saw Muslims were like, actually, they saw ethnic, ethnic people of ethnic backgrounds. And, and you know, they, they saw Bangladeshi mosques, Pakistani mosques. They didn't see any of this complexity from the outside. It's only when they became Muslim they saw that. And then they, see, they say, okay, I'm horrified to see all of this. And some of them actually revert, uh, convert back uh, to, uh, you know, they, they leave Islam again because they can't make sense of this. It's too complex, right? We say from the outside, Islam Allah, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, we say all about these things, but actually when you come inside, you see ethnic divisions, ethnicized communities. Um, so how do you make sense of that? And that's, the book tries to say, look, in order to get away from this, there's some contention. There, these are these, some of these areas that we need to fix. And it's not, it's not trying to say, look, this is something revolutionary. It's not. It's just basically saying, look, the, let's just look at this properly. Right, and it's actually now Islamic traditions, the uh, tradition of scholarship. You know, it's all there. We've just somehow kind of brought the Islam of South Asia into the UK and decided that it that's it. You know, it doesn't need to be adapted, or that doesn't need to be looked at in a way to make it contextualize, make it more relevant to our situation in the UK. 
I think there's there's a lot. I mean, I think South Asian is obviously it's it's a it's a key demographic because I think it's something like sixty percent of Muslims in uh, in or even more than that. Because I know I know sixty percent of the mosques in the UK are are Diobandi. Um, so that's kind of a, a big kind of a, one, one of the giants from the kind of a in Indo Pak subcontinent movement. Um, but what about the? There's a lot of other groups as well. So there's a it's a large amount of Arab mosques, and of course there's a, there's a lot of West African Muslims and and Muslims from other areas who just kind of get forgotten in the in the mix. Um, uh, and uh, do do you know any of the kind of the breakdown around that? And do these problems are these problems? Um, I, I know some of the sectarianism. So, for example, the Brilwi Diobandi divide only exists in in, in the Indo Pak subcontinent, maybe East Africa or something, where kind of it was the same community that went there. Um, and I guess we have a lot of parallels which we can explore in a bit. But do, do you know? If, do you know if other communities have the same thing? And have you explored any pockets of? Uh, uh, I don't know if there's like a Senegalese masjid in a, in a corner somewhere in the UK. No, there's a, in Luton. There's a Turkish mosque. The Turkish mother, the Turks go there. So, I mean, this is the, it's a generic problem. This ethnic, uh, my focus in the book is more South Asia, and that's only because a majority is South Asian, and also I have most insight in this, in this, so I didn't want to pick up an area that I didn't have as much insight in. Uh, but actually, generally, you can generalize this. It's, it's um, you know, wherever we've come from, our fathers or whatever, right, they, they've come here and, um, and we've just kind of stuck that version of Islam into the UK, and we haven't really um, looked at things. And if, if, if you allow me, one, there's one thing which I want to kind of, I want to give you a sense of what I mean by this. Uh, what is it that, that we mean by, you know, making faith more relevant, right, to the UK? And I'm just going to quote something which, and the book has lots of uh, examples, but I thought this example from uh, Sheikh Mohammed Nizami was actually really pertinent. Um, and actually, it's, it's, it's applying the Sharia to our world, right? This is the general theme. And actually, this is in context to the NHS. So you might say, what's this about Islam? You know, how, how does Islam, how does Allah give guidance that we can then, um, uh, you know, use that for our, uh, to, to, for in our polities that we have, right? And so this is in the context of the NHS. So this is what Sheikh Mohammed Izami said. There's nothing explicit in divine writ that tells us how to deal with a crumbling NHS, right? There isn't, because this is, this happened, it's happening now and it did not happen then. But the values of healing the sick, Shifa, through communal contribution, takaful, right, at the point of need is there, okay? But takaful also comes with a sense of civic responsibility that disparages waste, israf, and excessive request, and excessive medication. For us, this is the essence of responsible citizenship towards the NHS, where our morality affords all citizens access to healthcare, but that access is tempered by a social responsibility not to abuse the service. So can you see how suddenly we've tapped into core religious concepts, core concepts which Allah talks about it directly in the Quran, and now we're able to employ that in the context of the NHS, and it's given us a phenomenal sort of uh, uh, position, right? We're not saying it's going to be left or right. It's not about uh, political left or political right. We're actually saying this is actually, if you follow this sort of, the way of thinking, then you can actually solve a lot of problems. You can say, you can convince people, look, actually, you know, this is what Allah is probably asking you in this context of the NHS. So you can, can you see how we've suddenly made, made religion and Islam so relevant? My, my question is this, how many people actually do this? Are we, are we sort of at a level where we're sort of doing this, this has become normal? It's not. And the reason why it's not is because we're, we've got this thing, ethnic-centric religion, and we're doing identity politics. These things are preventing us from really do, getting do into Do you think it's identity politics only, or do you think this is more of a lack of strategy? Because one, one of the things is that if you look at a lot of Muslim organizations um, and the political work that we have been doing, um, a lot of it is focused on, for example, Islamophobia or kind of um, uh, diversity and inclusion and that type of thing, whereas actually Muslims are huge users of the NHS, especially because we, we tend to come from, uh, especially at the moment as the immigrant communities, we tend to come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Mm. And I can say, you know, especially in Birmingham, for example, we have a big kind of uh, divide. If you go to a nice area in Birmingham uh, or just outside Birmingham, it tends to be a uh, lower amount of uh, kind of um, Asian people, lower amount of Muslims. Um, and, and so we're big users of the NHS, but actually we're not even campaigning to try and keep it, um, keep it, 
uh, as as public as possible uh, and also the I, I think the the last point mentioned something about abuse mm. um, and we have a we, we we might be kind of responsible for a fair amount of it mm. um, civic sense we tend to lack it because you know um, you go to, outside a mosque or you go to a kind of Muslim majority area and the parking mm. is terrible and even the driving is terrible mm. um, and, and I think we were talking about this a little bit so do you think that's more down to our economic circumstances and our lack of strategy, or do you think it's 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 an it's an ethnocentric problem? I think um, it's probably a combination of different things. Um, you know, the fact that we're not educated. You know, as you know, if not, it's only the third generation that's become much more educated, and so you're starting to th- you're starting to see different sort of perspectives come in because of that. So I think there's that there's that element of things. Um, but I also think that um, you know. Just the way we approach religion, right, um, doesn't help us. And you know, if we approach it with with in a with this kind of away from ethnocentric lenses, then we might actually have a better chance of having a better strategy. I've seen lots. Of, I've seen lots of strategy um, because I'm I'm involved with some some charities and stuff, and they sometimes come to me and say, "Look, actually, there's this proposal. We want to see what your views are on it." And I've seen lots of uh, people who are strategizing. You know. Uh, but actually, they. Um, but there's a lot of flaws in the thinking, um, and and that flaw uh, is there because what is the baseline? What what is what what are these? What's the baseline, right? You know that we use and then we go forward from. If you don't have, if you haven't, if you haven't realized there needs to be a baseline or there needs to be a level that we need to get to, right? So that that's, allow. It's like a common baseline across all kind of uh, that everyone agrees on. Um, regardless of their ethnic background, yeah, I think I think you know to, to give you to to bring this ho- uh, alive, you know, something like um, the conceptions of alim and ilm, right? You know, we have this idea that it's um, it, there's a secular and dini sort of relig- uh, you know dichotomy, right? It's nonsense. Re- knowledge is basically uh, the, the uh, historically scholars are only classified it by beneficial, non beneficial, right? So as soon as you start doing that, you kind of realize. Hang on, you know, there's, there's, you know, it kind of gets you away from certain bubbles and certain biases in the way you approach, you know, just knowledge generally, right? So it's this kind of thing I'm talking about, baselining. If you look at, um, you know, there's another chapter in the book called the New Apna, right? Um, you know, in Bengali we call it Amrar Manush. It's our people. Same thing, right? Yeah. You know, the, the the you know, if you look at, but. Why is it that we call, we say apna just to kind of the fellow Pakistani or fellow Bangladeshi or fellow Arab, right? Why is it? It's because actually we haven't really looked at the concept of apna, right? In a way that will be helpful for us in the UK. And we haven't really made the link between apna and the Medinan society. We haven't really made uh, the connection between apna and terms Allah uses like qawm, millat, you know? And so, so we're not doing this kind of thinking, right? And and that's why what I'm saying baseline I mean is getting to a level where we where we have a, this baseline of uh, of of approaching religion, and we can, we can get we we can only get there if we get away from this eth- these ethnic filters that we have because from an ethnic perspective, you know you might say um, you know this is a this is a Bangladeshi mosque because this is a, this has all been Bangladeshi right, but is that you know twenty twenty nineteen you know when we when we have um, diversity and inclusion, these kind of um, uh, common principles in society, you know, how, 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 you know, is that still sensible for us to hold on to these terms, for instance, right? Yeah, so I, I guess I see your point from a message perspective is that we don't live in an age now, you know, back in the, you know, when you hear about like old Jerusalem and stuff, you had the Jewish quarter, you had the Arab quarter. <laughs> so we, it used to be a different kind of, um, uh, the, the, anyone can buy your the house next to you. So you yeah. could be living next to someone from, um, you know, anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and especially with Muslims, you you can't control the Muslims moving in. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we're stuck with a situation where mosques are doing kind of multilingual khutbas where, you know, top floor is English, someone's translating live. And the ground floor is the live khutbah, which is done in Urdu. But I mean more of some of the things that kind of ethnic um, 
ethnic identity pr- uh, protects us from is, for example, um, your iman goes up and down. Um, but if you're wearing hijab, and you're wearing hijab, let's assume for religious reasons, but you have a cultural kind of, um, uh, almost a cultural, like, there's a subjective something inside you, which means that you'd uh, you'd feel really weird going out without a beard, or you know, you'd, you you feel almost a cultural pressure to wear the hijab. So uh, it, it's like an additional protection, which is that you're doing something for, for the right reasons, for Islamic reasons, but on on a day when your iman really falls low, your cultural kind of uh, extra layer of protection uh, will will keep you kind of doing it and keep you on the straight and narrow, even if you're feeling a bit weak. Or the same with there's so much in so much in Arab culture where in terms of greetings, etc., where you've actually internalized Islamic principles. Um, and and when you when you kind of in your in your day to day life, for example, if someone you know if someone sneezes, you say you know. Uh, Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But also, when someone gives you something, you say, "Ya Taqi Alafiy, may Allah give you uh, something." What, what do you kind of say to that? Where these types of statements have been, and and this is where I guess eth- ethnocentric practice of religion has actually possibly added value to people's lives. Yeah, I think um, for first generation, second generation, I think um, you know uh, we have to be uh, realistic from the point of view of where they they, they came from, and um, they. Um, you know, a, lo- a lot of their religion is intertwined with their um, ethnic um, sort of cultures, right? Um, so, um, so for them, they had this uh, way of uh, approaching religion. And but if you look at third generation, um, they they are much more removed from their cultures, from their ethnic cultures. Okay, so for them, the question is, um, where do they get their inspiration from? Where do they make this new culture? That they feel comfortable in, right? But don't you also think a lot of third generation Muslims are actually removed not only from their culture but also from their religion? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's where the, re- the one of the reasons why religion they, they're removed from religion is we ha- we we haven't sorted out the baseline. So if you look at if you look at what we're teaching in maktabs, if you look at um, if you look at um, just the way we project Islam, right? It gives them a lot of a um, lot of difficulties in negotiating the world outside. In the macro culture out there, which is um, secular, which is anti-religious, which it doesn't really give significance to religion. So how do you then train people so that they'll be confident outside? These kind of, um, and, and the way we when, we, when we look at this, we kind of approach, approach at it from an ethnic view as well. And so the, when, we, when we try and do something, it's ethnic. Um, so so this, is, this is the thing where we're sort of, you know, this is the thing I, I argue in the book is that, these contentions, if we fix these contentions, we'll see suddenly we, we open up a whole new area of our mind and we can, we can see the, how, um, how guidance actually benefits us. Um, <clears throat> you actually mentioned, uh, you know, I guess doing Islam uh, and making sure that when we think about uh, the, the way we're doing things, you use the example of the NHS, for example. And then, of course, on, just on what Thaqib mentioned as well recently, um, uh, the question about whether or not with certain practices, is it more from an ethnocentric kind of point of view? Um, and you said, like, when we, the way we teach Islam, for example, in the, in the maktabs is very much still, uh, like, going back to the first generation. Uh, and it's very much, I guess, a non-applicable way uh, in the sense that when they come out they, they, and they see the real world, they're like, okay, this isn't exactly how I learned. And the thing is, I guess you have one people who ends up going on a more non-Islamic route kind of thing and just kind of abandons their faith, not in terms of leaving the faith uh, by, by announcing it, but just in terms of practice. And then you have maybe some uh, another population that sees British society and thinks, okay, uh, it doesn't, it's, it's not compatible with my values. My values are different. So therefore, maybe before I start giving back to the community and I guess doing Islam, I need to find a space where it's okay to be Muslim. And if I guess some, you know, if, if if Britain is a country where it, if my values are being tested or challenged, sh- you know, should I make somewhere else my home? Uh, you know. Yeah, I think if, if I mean, just to touch on that point of secular secularism, we haven't really properly studied secularism in a in a deep enough way, in my view. If you look at what, uh, things like she- um, Dr. Sherman Jackson is talking about the way he, he approaches secularism, right? And he says, actually, <coughs> his, 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 his coined uh, terms like the secular sharia, right? He's actually thinking really deep 
in saying, look, actually, um, you know, h- how do we solve some of these problems um, people have? We just say this is secular. A label we put, and we haven't really studied something in depth to say, actually, there's a lot of common ground here. Yeah. And then there's, there's, uh, there's these issues, right? So my so the the whole point is unless we get ourselves to that baseline, we're going to be forever entrapped in this kind of uh, this kind of mentality where we're not going to be able to progress forward and show there's there's real value and and relevance and and benefit that guidance gives us. This 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 is the challenge for our generation is to be able to do that and to look at something in depth and then be able to project um, an Islamic viewpoint that that others when others non-Muslims others see others listen. They say, actually, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's a point you're making there. At the moment, when we discuss these things, we appear to be very unreasonable people. We appear to be uh, kind of a bit dogmatic, um, and we don't go into the nuances and these things. Mm. Like hijab is a very good example, or niqab, and um, and loads of issues. I mean, I'll give you, I will give you one example. At work, there was a lady who said to me um, that, you know, um, religion, her, her understanding. She was, she was, a, she was an atheist. Um, a Cambridge grad, phenomenally uh, intelligent. She was she was saying that um, her understanding is that religion says that it can define good and bad. Okay, but I said to her, actually, that's not strictly speaking true because in the Islamic tradition, there's this maturidi uh, school which says actually, you know, there's um, you know there's 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 a huge amount which the Allah has given the human mind to be able to dif- differentiate between good and bad. You know these cognitive structures that Allah has created in us, right? Which allows us and socialization. You know all of these things help us to determine even this idea of consequentialism. But don't you believe that these these kind of you know, this mantik that you, you believe in that is informed by a holistic Islamic shell? So like you have. Oh, it speaks. <laughs> I was just listening. I'm, Sorry, I'm interested, I said this is it? the first I'm time you're speaking. Wow. He's learning the most. He's actually he's he's, he's observing us very no, well. No, I'm so with this. So, for example, the Maturidi school and yeah. how they use um, for their logic, etc., to determine what's good and bad, or what they think innately as humans, the human nature that Allah is still within them, and they believe that. So, but don't you believe that that is informed by a, a greater position in Sharia? Yeah, I mean, there's ayat in the Quran. Allah says, you know, um, that 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 speaks about this. So, they, so Allah is giving us guidance, and these guys have said, okay, based on that, we're going to formulate a way of thinking and. So my point is this: that when I when I sent, when I went back to her and said to her to, to, to this to this lady at work that you know that's you know there are elements um, there are lots of things which you know human beings can determine good and bad that's not contended in Islam because traditionally there's you know we've always said this thing and here's the ayat in the Quran that says it so um, when I when I said when I replied back that to her she was actually taken back she was saying hang on are you saying do you know what I mean so she was she was actually I was challenging her viewpoint of religion, right? In a way, which kind of she she got a bit more nuanced, and she said, "Okay, there's more to it than sort of meets the eye." It's this kind of level of interaction that so we need to have. I, I guess mo- most people would just, if, if they if asked that question, they would just say, "Yes, m- morality is divine, and uh, God God dictates what's moral and what isn't because we have something timeless. Um, you can't just change what's moral and immoral based on the conversations of people." So but I think a, what you're saying is that yeah. doesn't apply to every single thing. There are some things that we deem. No, I think what he's trying to say is that you'll have you'll have uh, you'll have something that stems from something else. So, for example, you look in Quran, you can't give an answer that, to something that is inherently twenty first century. You know what I mean? Uh, or, or no, I think uh, so. Basically, what I'm trying to say is even this the, what, what you've just said, Thaqib, Um I think it's too it's too um, it's too generalized, and and we we get into problems because we just want to give a simple answer. It's not simple. Things aren't simple. Reality isn't simple, right? Even basic parent-child relationships aren't simple, right? Life isn't simple. So when we, what I'm saying is, we can't give an answer that is that does justice to the uh, Islamic sort of perspective, right? Unless we we do some of these baselining. Um, so morality, um, you know, there's different schools, there's different 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 approaches to this. And different contexts, you know. So um, um, even picking on that uh, that secular secular term, why is it that Dr. Sherman Jackson is actually looking at this and coining a different term? Because he's trying to do some of these thinking in order to make sure that when we speak about secularism, we're actually speaking about it in a way which does justice to divine revelation. Because what do you mean? 
So, example. Well, uh, for instance, um, I mean, his argument, one of the arguments he makes is that, is that simply because there's something is secular does not mean that faith is not involved. So, for instance, uh, for instance, say, um, say I'm talking about, uh, you know, I, I want to create, I don't know, I'm trying to think hypothetically, a, a good, a, a reasonable example. Um, say I'm trying to create, um, create a house, right, for, um, uh, that's probably a bad example. Um, um, uh, now I'm struggling to find out. I, I was, I was just yeah. going to say only Allah can create, brother, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, wh- what I would say is, I, I, I won't do justice to what he's saying, but I would say look look up what he said, and what you'll find is that what he's trying to get at is just because something is secular doesn't mean everything about it is not connected to the divine. So, so divine, for, do you mean, you don't mean Islamically divine, you mean like... Some no, no, for us, when, when, when a Muslim, this again, when a Muslim speaks about divine, we're not talking about Allah, we're not talking about um, someone else, right? Yeah, but the so Muslims I'm talking about the Christians for, and the Jews believe in the same God, so for, when, when Dr. Manjakshin yeah. talks about divine, he might yeah. talk about a God in a, in a general nature, so... In yeah, the, but there is no, I guess there's no general nature, there's only the true nature. No, generally, in terms of the understanding of God. So you have the, th- the three religions, the Abrahamic religions that understand God differently. And when somebody who isn't part of, well, I don't know, he might not be part of any of them, he might be part of one of them. When he speaks about divine, he speaks about it differently. So for example, like no one, I don't think that disagreeing with the point about uh, a divine touch in secularism is, is, is it's, it's a contended point because it's not. Because if you look back two, three hundred years ago, for example, let's take a good example is equity. The law of equity in the UK started with the chancery, the Lord Lord Chancery in the UK, and that was informed by decisions of the of, of the churches. And the Lord Chancellor was elected by the church. And then they'd say that so equity, this law of fairness, this this flexibility and marginal appreciation in law was down to was down to the church. And then they'd say um, equity is the length of the Chancellor's foot. So whatever he wanted to be it would be. And then slowly over time when the UK started becoming more you know secularized I've got my uh, air air commas air com- air air quota- marks, quotation, yeah, marks. quotation marks when it started to become more secularized then we started moving away from that but the the principles that were developed by the church still exist today but they're used in a different way and I can understand when someone says that yeah there is kind of a divine inspiration in secularism etc um, but you have to you have to be able to understand that most of this divine legally or structurally in the UK politically uh, most of the divine inspiration that came to the the UK political system has been severely washed away, and the only things that remain are just some. Just they're just uh, sentimental little things that mm. keep us British. So the flag, for example, or um, what's that thing? The um, Westminster Cathedral, Westminster think, Abbey. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's just coming back to the secular term, then um, you know when we when we have a, a judgment call to make in a secular context. Right. As a Muslim, I'll I'll be thinking, what is it that I need to do to please my Lord? Right, Allah. Um, I'll, so my my decision in that secular context, my input in that into that secular context, will be slightly different, perhaps. Right, because I'm I've got another sort of criteria going on in my mind. Um, so I'll come I'm, I'll, I'll come at it slightly differently. But because of my contribution here, has that meant that? I've um, it's uh, you know I've been secularized or I've I've inputted into a secular system through secular sort of ideas. Is this a constriction of secular thought? So you have a mechanism that is inherently secular. When we say secular, then we mean the, a term that is clearly defined as secular. A system which is mechanically secular, and we have to make decisions as Muslim within that system, and then we use our own logic and we use our own reasoning and the, the tools we so, have as Muslims. Sorry, you said clearly defined as secular, as in clearly defined as worldly. As what we understand and is, for example, he, as somebody who says secular just off a whim, yeah. doesn't understand it. That's we're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody who understands that this is a secular mechanism that we're 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 forced to engage in. As Muslims, we have to use our logic, our rationale, and with the tools we have as Muslims to make decisions within these mechanisms. But we are constricted by that mechanism. It is inherently a constricting mechanism because we can't act outside of it. So, for example, one example is um, so what we talked about in the podcast a while ago about the schooling system in Birmingham. The whole was it in Solihull? Was it in yours about the um, the teaching of 
and uh, the park park field the school, park field school where, where yeah there, there was a protest about yeah, teaching the, the, of uh, the yeah. teaching of uh, the uh, lgbt uh, yeah, yeah sexual the, education exactly at very exactly, low yeah. very, very low very age. young mm-hmm. ages yeah um that is a, a good example of the muslim being forced to make a choice within a system which is inherently secular and the muslim is constricted by the system so as so far as that the muslim parents couldn't do anything but take their children outside the school Mm-hmm. It's not a very beneficial thing to do for a child at a very young age, a very impressionable age, to take them out of education. And these are the kind of things that we're talking about in terms of we have to battle with secularism in our day-to-day lives. And we, most of the time, we won't come out with strong Islamic positions because we live in a secular country. Although it's mm-hmm. informed by some kind of a Christian notion of God, etc., God, Queen and Country, but it's an inherently secular country. And most of the decisions that we make within this system are going to be bent to the whim of this so-called... Um, so, I mean, I would, I would say the uh, homo, um, you know, in terms of contentions, right? A lot of you, what we'll find is people always pick these, these few examples. The hijab, they'll always pick that. Um, uh, homosexuality, people pick that. Um, uh, khilafa, you know, Islamic State, they always pick that. So pretty much the basis and, and, of our and meat, probably, but you know, and yeah, it's a, with the, yeah. I mean, that's growing, right? So, you know, why is it that we kind of reduce our? It's, I don't think. Do you know a, what I mean? I don't think it's a reduction. I think it's personally that the things that the things that people don't talk about that may not be like so. The people talk about like you said, um, LGBTQ rights, um, hijab and khilafah and stuff like that. They're the things that stick out like th- sore thumbs because the other things that might be smaller, they generally are easier to accept for in a secular society. No one cares if you're going to do, for example, no one cares if your meat is halal slaughter or not. It doesn't affect people like that. But so, when you're so yeah, I mean, one of the other challenges we have here is that because we, because we, have, we don't approach things holistically, uh, you know, we haven't, you know, we don't make this argument to them, to, to people, to say, well, actually, we, you know, 90, 80 or whatever, 70 percent, we actually have shared grounds, right? You might come at it epistemologically, you might come at, come at it differently, but there's a lot of shared ground. We're not even making these kind of arguments. So the reason why I'm saying we're not making these arguments, we're doing ident- a lot of the time we're doing identity politics. Because we, we approach it at it from a, uh, you know, I have to, I have to um, uh, protect my religion, pr- uh, protect my iman, because I, ca- I can't give this person to this uh, uh, school where he's teaching homosexuality, you know, kind of uh, within their, uh, whatever they're teaching. But actually forgetting that at home, you know, we're not teaching the kids in a basic adab. So it's like, yeah, we're on the outside, we're, we're pretending we're sort of some, this great Muslim, right? But actually the reality is we're failing on our own, the things that we have control over. So, so this, yeah. what you're, I guess what you're saying is we're not, we're not engaging with faith on a deeper level. We're only protecting the kind of the very visible bits of it, which is some of these are the areas that you talked about or salah or things like that. Um, don't you think there's still a value of that, though, that you, these things are still something to be protected and something to be. And, and I guess the I, I thought actually what you were going with that was that, you know, you can pull your kid out of RSE in school, but you can't stop them watching, you know, cartoons or shows at home, which will also kind of get, give the same message, perhaps. Yeah, I mean this kind, this, this this that that exists, right? Um, in terms of um, people are doing um, pulling kids out of the school, but actually they're, you know, they they can they, they they've got access to, you know, um, um, explicit content, right? And and, and that's true all you know over I mean? the world because I yeah. I mean I I didn't grow up here, so I'm I, I guess I'm I'm interesting. I'm some governments do try to censor as much as they yeah. can. And then they're seen as oppressive regimes, etc., mm-hmm. etc. But when we we have to understand that when well, we live as, in, it's usually because the governments who tend to censor are actually oppressive regimes in other ways, maybe not. Yeah, in but, other yeah. ways, but yeah. not because of just yeah. censoring content on the internet. You know what I mean? Or, or they also tend to censor content which is of a political nature. Yeah, okay, like states just pushing out state-only newspapers or websites, etc. Like one good example is like um, China, for example, or North Korea. Yeah. If you look at it from censorship, then they are oppressive regimes as well. But some some regimes are not oppressive because of their censorship, but they're made out to be because, you know, recently there was a there was a, there was a ban that was supposed to be enacted on children viewing pornographic material online. Did you hear about that? Yeah. yeah. And it is most likely is it not gone through? Or I, I think I think it was pushed back. Like it was the, pushed, it's, yeah, it was pushed back. It, was pushed yeah. back. it had lots of issues. Yeah, and yeah. people were citing civil rights 
but mm. it was pushed back. Um, now we have to understand that civil rights apply to everyone, of course, if it's a baby or it's a 90 year old man. But when it comes to explicit material and the the law, the legislation that was going to be put in and the regulation was, was specifically for under 18 year olds, then we can't start citing civil rights. You know what I mean? Because parents have a duty to protect their children under the age under a certain age and the age is 18 in this country for example or even 16 from the age of consent yeah. and when we live in a when we live, when we live in society I think the, the, like the that, issue with that I, I'm quite close to it actually on that one it's age verification law is called um, the, it's the, very the, hard yeah it's, uh, it's implementation it's the uh, the ability to implement it in a way which doesn't um, cause other issues like for instance you know um, what if um, you know one, one, one of the challenges was if people get hold of your data of the, of the fact that they know that you have you know you, you've been going to these pornographic sites right then um they can potentially uh, do um uh they can they can hold you to ransom and those kind of things yeah but you have, you have the, VPNs and stuff nowadays so I don't yeah i think i think so so the point is this the government is trying to do something but the implementation of it the technological implementation, implementation isn't um isn't going to be brilliant Right, and and so then, then, then the civil rights guys are saying, look, because it can't be brilliant, right? Because it has these flaws, then, you know, you're actually not going to fix the problem. You just you're gonna you're gonna cause other issues, mm-hmm. and that's why they pushed it back. It's same with encryption. Government wants to uh, go- government doesn't want encryption, but actually encryption we need of encryption of data, data. of uh, okay. like personal whatever data. personal data, yeah. yeah. And but then you know encryption is vital to maintain a uh, maintain the uh, the privacy of your of the conversations you have online. So, but the government wants to, doesn't want to do it because or doesn't want that because or they want a backdoor hook into it because they they feel that they need to have that control ultimate control so that they can make sure that you know the general population isn't you know going well, in the direction they're not. So like. Ironically, in the Human Rights Act, which the repealing of it, we don't know about yet. It depends, it depends on Brexit. But in the Human Rights Act, <laughs> always, uh, something always has to go back to Brexit. Yeah. But in the Human Rights Act, mm. um, was it Article 8, I think it is, the right to... No, no, now you're just showing off. Exactly. The right to a private and family <laughs> life. Now, I said that you're a lawyer. Mm, yes. He in said the, it, in uh, the article, it yeah. talks about the, the limitations. Yeah. So it's a qualified right, the right to a private and family life. Yeah. The limitations to it, these fancy words are used like um, the pers- to pursue a legitimate aim in a democratic society. And that has opened up such a huge gaping hole for for states to literally dive in and claim legitimate aim in a democratic society. And I don't I don't think that this is especially like it's not only confined to situations of encryption, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, because mm-hmm. it's it's in an act which is it's in a it's in a piece of legislation which is supposed to protect our rights. Um, so we'll always be like that. I believe that the system is broken in a sense, not only British politics, mm. but even international mm. politics and international law. Um, the UN system, I think, is broken as well. Um, and that's why I have contentions with the idea. I've not read the book, uh, being a British Muslim. I looked, at, I flicked through it a bit um, online. But so, so you stole his book? No, no, I didn't, <laughs> because there were people posting sn- like snippets and stuff of it. And I clicked to it a, a bit of it, and I understood some of it. And then you did a um, where you were, there's a video of you where you go through the book, um, and you uh, you go through um, it's like a review, it's like a 40 minute video online on your YouTube page, mm-hmm. where you're going through it, and there's a guy next to you, and you say thank you for reading the book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you go through some of the key concepts in the book. Yeah, I went through some of that video, not mm. all of it. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> but. Uh, and uh, I do believe to a certain extent that the, from the title alone, being British Muslim, it's it's something that we need as, as Muslims um, and the uni- in terms of unification. But in terms of engaging with a system that is, I think, personally broken, I don't think it's going to work. Because you said that, for what, example... Uh, as, as a Muslim, um, you know, if something's broken, what is, you know, is it, we just let it, we let it so, be? So, yeah, the, do you know what I mean? If you, if you aim to fix yeah. it, for example, yeah. so you said that um, the NHS... Um, comment by Sheikh Nizami, for yeah. example, about how Muslims should engage with the NHS on an Islamic level. We don't need to be secular to start identifying with leftist, leftist politics or rightist politics. You know, exactly. We can do it ourselves as Muslims. How would you do that? You would have to go into either lobbying or pressure groups or politics itself. And a lot of Muslims do not 
like you can't change ideological uh, kind of uh, roots in a lot of Muslims because a lot of Muslims do believe that, for example, politics engaging in politics on that level is um, haram. For example, yeah. So this goes back to the baseline. People, we, we we're religiously illiterate. Honestly, we as a general population of Muslims in the UK, we're religiously illiterate. Um, we, 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 we say we're Muslims and then on that basis we engage the identity. We engage on the basis of the, of the identity. But actually, we don't understand what it means to uphold that identity, right? And so we get into all sorts of problems. But, of course, as Muslims, when we engage, they'll think, okay, it's the Muslims, right? Hey, they're saying that. But who, you know, no one is, is doing this sort of, if you like, fact-checking or... Any of that, right, to say, okay, to what extent are we Muslim? To what extent are we doing Islam? To what extent are we being, are we thinking about what Allah, the guidance Allah has given us? You know, we, 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 we've, you know, we focus on the rituals, right, which are very important, in, but we don't go beyond that, you know. And, and so the book says, look, we've got to start looking at some of these things in a more in-depth way in order to, to be able to come at a position, articulate a position for these things, right, where you're saying the system's broken, right? But of co- as Muslims, we should th- we should contribute to that to fix it because sometimes that's what it's not possible, though. So, like, so le- le- let me tell you, the Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given as a person. You know, he was actually, you know, before ta- Taif, yeah, he was very, very um, distraught, right, uh, around the Taif time. Also, you know, Khadija was, died around about the same time. Right, he was v- well, exactly. he was very very it was a very bad time, you know, and um, and you know Allah said Allah Allah says, uh, and I'm not sure if that is partly related to that um, to that time or not, but Allah did say to him that your job is to be a warner, right? The result is to Allah. We're not even, and the point I'm trying to make is we're not even doing the warning. We can't even do the warning if we bring a substance which isn't really backed up by a proper religious understanding understanding of the Sharia, uh, um, you know, uh, contextualized to the UK. That's my main point. We can't even do this warning. So we're going up to the government and saying all of the X, Y, and Z, and, you know, we're, we're saying we, we agree to the Islamophobia definition. We haven't done any of the analysis uh, and the thinking that uh, based on a Sharia kind of perspective, right, in order to even do these, some of these things. And that's my point in the book. So the, the one, the point, the point there is, so when you, br- you bring the Sira, for example, and you talk about warning and Allah saying that you are here to warn the people and the, the decision and the and the final kind of... Um, the outcome is up to Allah. Is up yeah. to Allah. But our job is to is to warn. To but warn we, we shouldn't take warn uh, literally here. Yeah? What that actually means, we, our, our job is to um, contribute, to convey, to um, argue rationally, to... A policy work, for example. Kind of policy yeah. work, yeah. Okay. yeah. So one contention of that, would be not my personal contention, but one would be mm. that, for example, we have. Are you asking for a friend? What do you mean? I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, fuck it, basically. Yeah. Um, um, one contention would be that somebody who is here to, so for example, a broken system, a broken NHS, and we as Muslims want to, because you said that we shouldn't be focusing on just like issues that are just macro in the Muslim community, like LGBTQ and hijab, etc. So we'll use the example example of NHS and um, Muslims and the, let's say for example a Muslim group starts doing policy work on the NHS and starts in for, um, uh, advising the British government or the health secretary. Now, in terms of comparing that to the Sirah, because he brought the Sirah into it, when the Prophet Sallam was talking, when he was public policy, when he was discussing public policy with leaders, etc., and when it was when when the time came for, how do I say it now? Um, Engaging with political leaders, as Prophet said them, when you bring the idea of being a warner into it, it doesn't directly relate to what actually happened in Sirah. Because when when the Prophet said them was in, um, when when he's engaging with political leaders, he isn't there advising political leaders. He's there to basically s- put a seal on something, stamp stamp an is- an Islamic approval in something. So he's saying this isn't what we believe should happen. What, what, what political Just, leaders do you mean he was engaging with? So. During the so when the Prophet engaged with political leaders, most of the time when the Hijrah was made, it was Nusra, and so the Prophet sought Nusra and these tribes to pledge allegiance. And when you have this idea of pledging allegiance, it's not something that is submissive 
you know, where Islam is at. What you mean by political leaders is the, the ones he sent the letters off to. So the ones he sent the letters the, off the to. The Caesar of Rome. And, 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 and the, the tribal leaders in Arabia as well. So he sent letters off to uh, political leaders in different countries. Yeah. And also tribal leaders. This is when he sought Nusra because he didn't seek Nusra off to the to, to state rulers. He, he sought it from clans and tribes. Um, well, he sought it from state rulers as well. well. Yeah, but the most the most of it was clans and tribes. You read the Sirah, the Prophet is engaging in discussions. He's he's talking about um, he's talking to tribal leaders and they're asking him, "What can you give me?" And he goes, "Allah will give you." And then most some of them are saying, "Okay, after you die, can we take the leadership yeah. over as well? Can we take the torch?" And he goes, "No." And then a lot of them leave. This shows an uncompromising nature, not one which is based on advice. And if something is applying that to. The NHS might not be applicable, but in terms of general political ideas and policy work, it can be applicable. So we have to be careful when we're applying Sira to issues of advice. Um, and we have to understand that when we talk about applying Islamic uh, Islamic ideas to a secular narrative, for example, the, the engaging with the NHS, then we have to make sure that our understanding, if we want it to be Islamic, if we want to do Islam, then it has to be derived from something Islamic. You can't do Islam just from our behavior. Example: We can but say it, I, can yeah. be, I can be a courteous person. Islam teaches us to be courteous, teaches us to be um, respectful, etc. And if I'm doing that, but I'm spouting some absolute garbage, I can't say that's Islam just because of the way I'm acting. There yeah. has to be actual some content to it. There has to be some. Yeah, ab- to absolutely. It. And and the, the, some of the policy work that goes on now, right? Mm. People say, okay, this is the identity politics coming in. Yeah. They say I'm I'm Muslim, and therefore this is the Muslim viewpoint, and therefore it's a Sharia viewpoint, right? This is the kind of implied that's sort ridiculous, of ridiculous, isn't it? That's and that's what's going on actually. Yeah. Um, and, and just to you know, we we have we have we have the we have the Sira, but also concepts uh, which are very. Uh, mainstream, very core to the to religion, things like you know, nasiha, giving nasiha, giving you know, having ikhlas. You know, what is ikhlas? You know, it's actually, it's actually in in sort of um, you know, in policy work. What is ikhlas in policy work? How do we bring that? How do we bring that to life? That actually um, gives people, inspires people. It's something different. You know, it's not just saying this is a dogmatic view we're going to take, but actually the way you approach it. You know, a lot of Islam is about how. Hmm. You know, um, it's not just about what. You know, um, and and so sometimes we we forget even even some of the policy work we do we we, we just think about the what and not the how, and and that's that's what, that's but when I it has to be a balance between both though. Yeah, absolutely. So like and you said, some people do say that I'm Muslim, therefore my opinion is, you know, it's it's it's, it's uh, it has authority in Sharia. You know, but that's not the case. But you also yeah, I mean, can't just I mean the thing is they won't they won't say that it has authority in Sharia, but the context of in the, this engagement is that you're you're representing Muslims, right? So therefore, the it's 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 um it's implied, right, that you are actually representing a faith, okay? Whether you are consciously doing that or not, as in like you're representing uh, Allah's guidance, right, versus Muslims as people, right? You know, you might not be consciously saying I'm representing Allah's guidance here, but you, the people who you're representing it to. The people you're engaging, they're going to perceive it as okay. This is these are Muslims, therefore it's a faith-based perspective. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of that goes on at the moment. And this is some of the some of the t- entanglement we get right with all sorts of issues, is because because of this kind of identity, the way we play with identity, um, it's not very well understood. So how would you how would you come about policy work then? Well, firstly, I would say is understand the religion first. Okay. A lot of people go into policy work without uh, no Sharia background, and then they're talking about Muslims. Um, and a very good example is the Islamophobia um, definition, right? The, the latest Islamophobia definition, which the APPG has, uh, APPG for British Muslims has has backed, mm-hmm. and pretty much all yeah, I gonna, organizations. I was going to bring that up because yeah. I've uh, I've seen yeah. your tweets and the article about it. Yeah, I think I think you know it's basic. That's no, a classic example of what you're that's a very about. classic example of yeah. people doing policy work, right? To very about. very much a very core Muslim sort of thing, but actually, you know, no one's actually come at it and said, "Look, actually, this is you know this is based on what I believe Allah is telling me, and here's my sort of reasoning for that." I've not even seen any of that, and the only person who's done it has actually said, "Actually, don't back this definition because who's that? Uh, Sheikh Muhammad Zami, okay. you know, he's the of all the Muslim scholars, and I'm, I'm I'm in touch with a lot of scholars, um, 
and you know th- there's no one who's actually engaged this area from a sharia perspective sometimes uh, some so, so you mean they all come at it from how do we protect most muslims or yeah i think i think yeah i think they they come at it from the point of view of um what uh, what is um what is um you know who should we back basically no but i i think the the kind of the definition of islamophobia from a a lot of the kind of activist groups and stuff what their aim from that is to protect as many people as possible from far right extremism and so that's why they've tried to make the definition as broad as possible when you approach it from a sharia perspective as in what does god mean by islamophobia in a british society a what do you what well you could you could argue that from a conceptual point yes we should approach everything from a you know what does god want out of it perspective and that's fair but in a british society does it, is that what gives us the maximum um no, but we shouldn't benefit? we shouldn't like islam shouldn't the protection of muslims shouldn't be governed by utilitarian principles like the islamophobia definition like we don't you don't say like we need to i think, I think the, to be honest i think i think, I think that muslims. definition that that definition is not even a utilitarian definition basically what they've done is they've 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 come at it from a point of view of they've racialized islam they've said look there's there's is muslim racism they've they've uh, the, the intersectionality of this right is so intractable that actually you can't um if you know it's 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 it's, it's racism to muslims okay well, you could, but but it's not though because i remember when we had azhar kayum on the episode on the man episode um he was speaking about race laws surrounding the jewish community and the sikh community so when you when you so, call so someone, his his argument was that the islamophobic uh it was the, an the argument though, he was, he was Sorry. Citing regulation. yeah his his point about the regulation was that islamophobia regulation isn't close enough to the racism definition yeah. which is why um it's incredibly hard to prove which is why we're we're stuck in so a situation you, you know, where we have a lot of the clearly Jewish, islamophobic the Jewish hate community crime. are strongly linked to a specific race the sikh community are strongly linked to a specific race the punjabi the, the punjabi people in india and pakistan um but the muslims one of the most diverse religions in the world everyone like you can you can walk down the street and you can see a white muslim a black muslim a yellow muslim a blue muslim you know there's no specific race to a muslim i'm not sure the smurfs have a <laughs> <laughs> papa smurfs got a beard yeah. so the, 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 that's the issue like you yeah. can't really mm. it's very hard to tackle islamophobia from from a race perspective when you and, you can't to be honest that, and, and that definition that definition is so broad that they're actually not just tackling um tackling sort of anti muslim hatred sort of uh, the far right sort of uh, attacks kind of an anti muslim sort of abuse and hatred that goes on but actually they're also tackling other things like um problems with social mobility you know getting jobs you know they, they so they've kind of broadened this definition to cover to be able to fight lots of disparate diff- issues right with this one definition and again this is if you do problem solving properly you will not have a definition that is so vague because you're trying to tackle so many things right you'll actually start off with something which is much more um easier to to grapple with right and then build on that what they've done is they've kind of built a definition in order to attack so many different areas so i guess what i guess what you're talking about is we need to scope the problem to get at the root cause um and and these and and clearly the problem hasn't been scoped because political expedience and trying to make compromises and get everyone to back this definition has meant that we've incorporated um because i i tried to do a um uh, we tried to pass a little motion in in student union council about um kind of food provisions for muslims and usually when you try to get someone to back it they throw in their allergy thing and then they say can we get peanut allergies and then this and that and this and that and it becomes bigger and bigger so i think legislation by its nature tends to be and and and, and i would say that's possibly what happened Restricted. with this um sorry what do, mean, what do you mean legislation why it tends to be what it, it tends to like incorporate other things so you try to solve yeah, that's, that's, because it's so no, hard to equality, get a bill through yeah, one example perfect example is the equality act so the equality act in section 45 it has something called protected characteristics that's race religion sex disabilities etc so there's like 10 of them there's a lot there and people argue that since the equality act does encompass religion and race that we don't need definitions for islamophobia or um uh what's anti antisemitism etc etc so but i i guess i guess my point is that my yeah. point is that if it's if it's a political definition that was done for the bit, for the reason of a kind of political act i agree that maybe the definition isn't 100% accurate but 
I, I get the sense that you don't even back it from a political point is that we should protect those things because everything there the everything that the APG definition protects Muslims against are things that we should be protected from. Um so what, what uh, the, one of the big challenges uh, people are facing is that um um in this area is um you know a freedom of expression, right? A lot of people are saying, look, I can't now if you're if you're if you if, you, if you're white and if you're from the right of politics, okay, and you want to challenge Muslims and you put something out there, what they're saying is this could be construed as Islamophobia, okay. So my my point to all of this is, I c- I could back I could back definitions and I can agree definitions on lots of things, but my main thrust here is that we haven't even done the sort of the. Uh, the viewpoint from a Shari perspective, right? Like, what is it that what is it that I can feel? You know, I I I, I learn from the Quran, the Sunnah, and teaches me to say, okay, this is a definition which I really sort of can back from a religious perspective. So you're we saying haven't we even should, done we that. We should find Islamophobia as the Quran defines it. Well, the Quran. That's the thing, though. If you want to use Sharia to define Islamophobia. Then you're going to be left with Islam because anything that is encompassed with is, within Islam that is discriminated, somebody can say it's Islamophobia. If someone comes up to you and says to you, "Your hadith are nonsense," blah 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 blah, your hadith propagate Aisha getting married at the age of six, you know, um, yeah, child marriage, etc., etc., and uh, brutal mass killings, etc., etc. Would you see that as Islamophobia? Some people would. If someone comes up to you, yeah, but with and the, says, so again, hitting the wife in the face with a miswak. Is not allowed, but you can hear it all over the body. You guys are barbarians. Would that miswak be the idea of the I, uh, Abdullah? I'm going to use this for the miswak being encom- encompassed in the Islamophobia definition. Anything within Islam that is discriminated yeah. against, but, and, and for, for, I'm for, not for, for, for me, uh, the, the problem starts from the from as early as when we put the word Islam and phobia together, right? And you know, already we're causing problems because yeah, actually the word phobia, right? Phobia, Islam gives everyone. Who is non-Muslim or even Muslims, the right to be scared, the right to hate religion. Islam gives everybody the right to go to hell. This is the coming into sort of some of the philosophy behind Islamic law. Mm-hmm. But Islam, uh, Islam ha- in the legal system allows that, right? Because if if it doesn't, if it doesn't say, look, you got the right to want to go to hell. What is Islam? Is it some sort of authoritarian sort of something? What is it? People have got to choose virtue. People have got to choose uh, the love of God and worship of God. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, exemplified it, you know, like, um, you know, uh, going back to Taif example, right? You know, when, when Allah said, you know, do, what do you want me to do? You know, he said, no, don't, I don't want you to destroy them. Because this is, this is teaching for us to say, look, you know, it, the, the, these things need to be understood in a proper context in order in order to get the right um, relevance that we need to bring in. I 100% agree with your point. But the only issue is yeah. people have the right to go to hell. They can say what they want, etc. Cetera, et cetera. They yeah. have the right not to believe in a, in a secular society or an Islamic society. However, when it starts affecting the lives of Muslims, which is why the Islamophobia definition was made in the first place, to protect Muslims. If it's to do with the protection of Muslims, protection of the Muslims' lives, then that's not an issue of you have the right to go to hell. It's an issue of you don't have the right to do that. You can have the right mm. to go to hell, but you don't have the right to drag this person down with yeah. you. So this is where, this is where things, this is where I'm saying you've, got to, you've now then got to approach it pragmatically and say, look, is a definition which is about protecting multiple layers of Muslim issues that they may have, is that definition, where do you start? Do you start with a, a grandiose definition that tries to encompass everything? Or do you start with something which everyone can buy into? Right? Even, if you're even from the uh, political right, you'll buy into because you realize actually people do need protecting. And this is where I'm saying, let's not go for a grandiose definition that, that does that. Let's go with a definition which... To start with, with, with which uh, at least it gives us something that we can protect Muslims from being, you know, from their hijab and other things being pulled from, uh, from being uh, facing um, abuse or you know, those kind of things, right? Let's get that level, then we can talk about other things. And 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 so this, so th- this is this is what I'm saying in in that chapter is, um, if we go with a definition that says, okay, anti-Muslim hatred, 
Okay, and this is the kind of the the other camp says we should call it anti-Muslim hatred. I'm more in that camp. So uh, I, on I, this, I believe that Falcon made a good point about the the the, the vast nature of the definition. Is you'd rather have an Islam that is fairly constricting upon public opinion for the sake of the protection of Muslims, rather than an Islam that's fairly libertarian. To the, to the because again, we're not, I, I, I have trouble with this idea of libertarian and all that. These are terms we, which we're using, which I don't, I don't want to just label, just use out of, you know, because I think when we start using terms, you know, uh, to when we then look into that, you know, I can say there's a lot of aspects of Islam which you can say is actually libertarian. So what is it? Is it libertarian Islam or not? What is? Well, yeah, you know I mean? Adam Smith talks so about libertarianism as well. It's, but I'm talking about yeah. li- libertarianism in terms of the... The, the views of people, like you said, we're talking about the Islamophobia definition and the freedom of expression. Now, if you want to talk about libertarianism to do with the economy or um, free market trade, etc., <coughs> we could do that. But when we talk, when in this context, this is what I'm speaking about, the freedom of someone to, 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 to hate um, vocally or um, physically, etc. Um, I think personally that the, uh, an Islamophobia definition that encompasses and restricts that even though people have the right to go to hell, if it restricts that um, in a way which would benefit the Muslims, rather than doing something which is very nitpicky and only benefits the Muslims, not only protects the Muslims in certain acts, or, uh, which you believe to be balancing the balancing of ideas, so people can do this, but when it comes when it crosses this line, then we can't start we can't start doing it. I feel as though a, a larger protection is is warranted. In such and a I guess it's also in the public sphere. So this. Freedom to, you know, want to do whatever you want. I mean, just because we have laws against anti-Semitism doesn't mean people aren't anti-Semitic in their private quarters. It just means they can't do it in public and they mm-hmm. can't um, kind of, of proselytize course. towards it. Um, and I guess that's what that, that's what the... My point about... If you make the definition wide, you're protecting a wider number of people. So why, why would... Why would well, so the, I mean, problem? there's two things. There's, there's a definition. There's a definition. How good is the definition itself? But then actually you have to realize, is this definition going to be uh, accepted by wider mainstream society? If you come up with something, a definition which people, people think is too wide, is, is too vague, you know, you, you're always going to be fighting this war of definition. We need to get away from that. Um, so some people will accept it, some people won't, and then we'll forever be discussing this, this, this idea of example, what it is. It's been for decades, right? And it's intensifying now. And now, you know, so... So, so you've also got to look at a definition that is practical that most people will accept as a way, you know, of of, of going forward. Otherwise, we'll be here again, you know, in five years' time, you know, still discussing it. Well, Which, <laughs> um, I guess we can we can go on for uh, for longer, but we do have to we do have to stop um, because it's almost Isha time. We I, I have one more question I wanted to ask you. You mentioned a few times um, that we need to do this baselining, right? We need to baseline yeah. ourselves and kind of come up with a united kind of, um, I guess, a, maybe you would say non-ethnocentric uh, version of Islam. What would this baselining work like? Uh, how sorry, would it look? Work, yeah, how would this baselining look like? And like, what, what, do you envision like a workshop? Because I know you have a, cha- a chapter there called the Charter. Yeah, um, I think so. Um, so uh, there's some principles. I think if we... There's got to be some principles that we say, okay, these are principles or values, right, which we say, okay, these are ones which we're guiding. If we, whatever we do, we try and we try and look at those principles and see how, to what extent we align to that or how far close we are with them, right? On that, because if we do that, then I'm thinking, okay, the, over time, because this, is, this, isn't, this, this stuff is not going to get fixed overnight. It's, this is why part of the project, the, the wider project that this book is part of is, is looking at 2050. We're saying we've got to do stuff now so that in 2050, you know, we 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 will be in a better position, right? So, so gradualism. Like a, no, I'm, I don't want to use the word gradualism because again, that's like it's got its own connotations. What I'm saying is, it's a generational issue, right? We can't fix this. The reality is, we can't fix this now. I can't. We can't just within a year we can't fix all these things. Yeah, divorce of the right? divorce of the negative or positive connotations of it. It's yeah. just gradual steps towards something in 2050 that you will hope to achieve, right? I would say in a on a cultural level, 2050 is really close. 
Like it is very close. That's how I was 30, 30 years. 30 yeah, years. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's generation. One yeah, generation. it's just one generation because if you look at other Muslim communities in countries that are non Muslim, that mm. can, like South Africa, etc., it took them five, six generations. Um, if you look at countries like Kenya, etc., where Muslims are kind of accepted as part of the fabric, even though they still have some problems, yeah. but they're, you know, five, I six. Think, I think one of the problems is some people might have with this idea of working some, something now. Um, that you'd hope to achieve in 30 years or one generation is that there are going to be a lot of victims in this in this thir- this 30 year gap and a lot of people are not comfortable with that uh, although it's impossible or implausible to have what do you mean by victim what do you mean by victims of uh, one example is Islamophobia no no i mean what what's happening to these victims because i guess not to not to say that you know it's not a big deal and they're, they're not there aren't real issues but do you mean that people will be susceptible to ideas and they'll change their no, minds? So for or? example, uh, talking about the socio-economic um, position of Muslim families within the UK, um, a lot of them, I think one in four Muslim youth live in the UK's most deprived areas. I would class them as being victims of a system that is inherently, um, I won't say Islamophobic, but I would say it's it, there's, a, there's a tinge of bias there. Um, yeah, so so basically, there's there's um, and maybe we, maybe I can uh, we've got time to sort of maybe talk about this. So there's I bracket out the the different issues, if you like, in quote unquote of Muslims in the UK mm. into four different brackets. Okay, the first one is about is this in the book? This is yeah. So you have to read the whole book to kind of get okay. it. I'm kind of summarizing it in okay. one. So basically, what you have to um, there's four different areas, right? What I call pervasive headwinds. Is a pervasive headwind. You spoke about that in the video okay. as well. Yeah. So basically, the first one is around uh, media bias, negative portrayal of Muslims, Islamophobia, in that sort of bracket, right? This negativity that exists, Islamophobia, all that kind of stuff. So that's one bracket. Another bracket is another sort of pervasive headwind is basically is looking at the society we live in and the prevailing values in that society. So, for instance, the key one for us is that a very few proportion of the society actually values um, um, religion I think the Pew Research and others have done lots of studies it's about 10% 10, 11, 12% uh, of people actually think religion is, should be a significant part of our lives that's the, that's the general sort of society we live in that's another thing right these two things are different a lot of people will combine all of these things and not be able to kind of dissect them and sort of issues uh, you know interrelate issues which are kind of have different roots right so I'm saying these are different issues and then the third bracket is around looking at you know our intergenerational socio demographic socio economic issues. These are also a separate thing. Part of this is because we're third generation. We can't expect you know you know if you start from a lower sort of uh, starting point, you can't suddenly within one generation be like you know the best of the uh, you know um, the best the best ethnic or whatever group whatever right best Muslims best uh, you know religious faith group. It's difficult, right? So there's there's all these socioeconomic demographic uh, issues out there which need to which have their own issues like integration and then the fourth uh, fourth pervasive headwind is around the contentions and the book actually focuses on that so but what what the book also says is that if you solve your contentions internal contentions then what internal you can contentions. <coughs> I think um, so. The internal, external is like uh, you know you can. Um, I'm saying internal because from the point of view that we're doing religion from an ethnocentric way, okay. we you know and we're doing religion with, with identity politics involved. So I'm saying if we fix some of these things, then what we'll find is we'll be able to propose new ways of solving the society issues. Right uh, around you know only ten percent. Why is only ten percent of people value religion generally? Is it because actually we haven't conveyed religion in a way which really inspires them? Where is Islam in that? You know, ninety percent of people have never been to a mosque. That's just one. one, one you know, I think it's to do with effective then, competing powers, though. You have a competing power, a government, which. No, I think I think I think I think I think let's let's forget about structures. Let's forget about structures for the time being because we've got too much of a focus on structures impending on us makes, when we don't even know religion ourselves. But that makes the idea, the issue very minimalistic then. So you, 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 you're reducing the idea of change to something that the Muslims can do them by themselves by changing public opinion when you've got this competing narrative. Yeah, so what I'm saying is this, right? I'm, I'm saying, yes, the challenge is the structure uh, imposes on people, right? There's no doubt. But what I'm saying is this. We're not even at a stage where we can say, look, 
this is me as a Muslim based on my religious, you know, inspired thinking that I'm proposing this. We're not even there yet. So this idea that we can suddenly, we can, we can, you know, we can, we can, we can have a play in the in 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 the structures, right, and be Muslim at this today, I think I think is a bit of a you know misnomer at the moment. So I don't think thirty years would be that. Yeah, no. So thirty years, basically, obviously, things are always changing. I'm saying thirty years as a way, as a as a challenge for us, right? To say, look, in the next generation, by the time my kids are thirty, forty, whatever, right? I don't want to have the same discussions with them, right? I want to have more, more deeper, more sort of, you know, more productive discussions, if you like. That's basic. That's why twenty thirty. The reason why I mentioned twenty thirty, twenty fifty. Sorry, is is because some of the projections for the growth of Muslims. Is going to be about nine, ten percent at that point. And that's that's the only reason why I picked twenty uh, twenty fifty. It's a generational sort of time. I uh, think I think that's a very interesting kind of point to end on because one of the things I found is that um that, that speaking to people from kind of one generation ago who were active in the nineteen eighties uh, in the Muslim community, um, what I get the impression is that they were doing pretty much the same stuff we're doing right now, and they were fighting a lot of the same challenges we're fighting now, um, and. The conversations are very similar to we are now, so we haven't we we've moved forwards in many ways, but we haven't moved forward enough. Um, and I guess, um, I guess if we if you if you say that this past thirty years might be identical to the future thirty years, then we have to ask whether this this whole this whole thing that we've got in place about working towards something like an end goal that's really really far down the line is something that Muslims can. I don't. Behind. To be honest, I don't like this idea of end goal. The end point for us is death. Each of us, when we die, that's the end point. This idea of end goal, we're working yeah, towards I something. Think we have I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's. Um, I don't think. So that's, I guess this is more of I mean. a. This is more of a milestone. Yeah, it's a milestone. It's something to aspire to. It's like putting a time f- timeline. Say, look, let, where do we think we'll be at that point? Okay. It's more that. It's no. This idea of end point. The only yeah, end the point milestone, is death. Milestone. Aspiring to this milestone. Yeah. And putting your weight behind. But then there will be something else. So by, by the time we're reaching twenty fifty and twenty forty five, we'll have a new plan, and that's what we work yeah. towards. And the and next no, generation. I understand that. Yeah. I'm just saying that the idea is for some, for a lot of people actually, it's yeah. hard to get behind that for these thirty years, that which may be like Falcon mentioned, identical to the past thirty years. Yeah. Because we are that. in a very similar. So we position. have to. What we have to do is what's happened in the last thirty years, and this a lot of the book is about that. Is saying okay, the last twenty years it's been wasted time. A lot of the, if you look at some of the government policy that's been that's that we are living through now today is because of the of the of the stupidity that's gone on in the last twenty years, right? And so what we need what we need to say is look can, what are the lessons we need to learn from the last twenty thirty years so that we don't make the same mistakes again going forward. So we mentioned this in one of the episodes about home, about the feeling of home is for someone someone the house and a home are different. A house is a building, a home is something that you make it, and you want to feel comfortable in your home. You have to want to feel safe in your home, and you want to feel as though you have some kind of propertorial right over your home. Um, but if Muslims in the UK, not my opinion, I'm just saying, if Muslims in the UK feel as though that they can't call this place their home, then I feel as though in the future, this 30, 50 years, 100 years... But actually all the evidence is telling us Muslims love this place. All the all the surveys done, they they, they really um, attach yeah, that, themselves as, as... Some people might as, say that as, that, as, that... as, you know, as part of Britain and they value being in Britain. Right, and, yeah, ex- 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 of course, yeah. but some people might say that that is not from... Uh, a position of um, derived from Islam. Some people they'll it'll be economic reasons. No, so for instance, let me, let me let me give you an example. Historically, the first four hundred years of Muslim of Islam, right? Large sections of um, of you know um, Syria, Iraq, um, uh, Northern Africa, large large sections were actually um, non-Muslim. So in so many places, Muslims were non uh, Muslims were in the minority. Okay. This idea that we can, you know, we, you know, we should, we, sh- we can't call ourselves, we should have trouble s- saying a place is home because we're a minority and we have challenges. If you look, it, well, if it, you, it, if you look it, at these a, areas, Iraq, Syria, North Africa, yeah. these places, there was effective efforts by the, the sultans, etc. to make uh, Islam the, the dominating uh, political power in that region. We can't say the same about the UK. Uh, if we do, then we are branded 
in as extremists, well, etc. So we have I would to go further than that and say that during that time, a lot of it, a lot of that time, the the Muslims were in power in those areas. They were, yeah, they were, and but they worked, but they worked towards so, effective power. So guidance, you have to understand guidance based on three things: what is your context, yeah, what is your space, right, and what is your responsibility and roles. But surely that should fall yeah. back on Sunnah. No, no, let, 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 hear me out. So basically, so, so for, for people who are trying to, um, you know, um, teach, um, uh, you know, um, um, raise children, right, and going to work, right, is that person going to have the same, same responsibility? Are they going to be accountable for the same thing as someone who is actually like Sadiq Khan, who is in government? Zakhla Khair, that's a really interesting point about Sadiq Khan being um, accountable more than kind of your average your average Muslim Joe or Ahmed or whatever. Um, but unfortunately, I do have to stop you there um, because we do need to get going. Zakla Khair for your time. That was really interesting and I definitely think we need to have you uh, back again. Um, Assad's done a little bit of a runner. Um, uh, I'm here. Scotland. Uh, sorry, not Assad. I'm just saying I've just done, done a runner and gone off to, um, gone off to Scotland again. when he went blank for like 30, 40 minutes. Um, and... Uh, you can follow us on uh, the Middle West um, at the Middle West PC. Uh, you can email us middlewestpc at gmail dot com. Uh, Facebook, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, um, uh, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. anywhere you get podcasts. Apart from SoundCloud at the moment, uh, where we're trying to get on, um, and you can find us on YouTube as well. Uh, you can follow Doctor Mamnoon on Twitter. I think that's where you're most active. Yeah. The, so the project is at UK Muslims Twenty Fifty. That's probably the best place to. Uh, that's uh, that's that has all my uh, doesn't have all my personal ramblings. It's more specific to the project. Well, okay. Although, although, if someone although, wants to hear your personal ramblings, yeah, his personal, ramblings, personal are ramblings are at uh, at Dr. Mamnun Khan. All one, all uh, one. Yeah, M A M N U N. Website as well, hasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So www.beingbritishmuslim.com. That website is where uh, the book, uh, the project around the book, uh, there'll be. There'll be uh, papers. I'm writing a, f- a couple more papers. One which I hope to take to uh, MPs and other th- other people, um, uh, which will be coming out. So if you follow, if you want to ha- follow uh, the progress of this project, the website is probably the best place to to yeah. do it. So beingbritishmuslims.com, Jazakum Lahir. Um, and yeah, we uh, we're not cool enough to have a website yet ourselves as a podcast, but you know we'll get there inshallah. Um, but yeah, please like, subscribe, send us your feedback. Uh, let us know uh, of more guests that you would like. Um, and if you are a, if you think you're a potential guest and you have something interesting to <laughs> yeah, um, talk to us about, please pop, uh, drop us an email on middlewestpc at gmail dot com. Uh, with that, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.